of course, it has been reported after any intraocular procedure, whether it's a cataract, it's a keratoplasty, a glaucoma surgery. We are unlucky here in glaucoma in our specialty because we deal with intraocular pressure. We see patients with high IOP, and we always aim to lower their IOP, so we encounter choroidal hemorrhage more than any other specialty. And of course, as you know, all their methods of cataract extraction, they were removing the cataract through large incisions. So the incidence of choroidal hemorrhage in such procedures was higher compared to small incision, clear corneal incision, fake emulsification. And from a glaucoma perspective, it has been reported from uh, in all, almost all, glaucoma procedure, whether it starts from a trabeculectomy or a glaucoma drainage device or even cyclodestruction where we <clears throat> apply laser to the ciliary processes and lower the intraocular pressure sometimes, choroidal hemorrhage can happen after that as well. Those are some of the famous clinical trials in glaucoma, and here they outline, this table outlines the incidence of choroidal hemorrhage on those trials. So just in summary, you can notice that it ranges from zero up until 3% um, uh, of incidence uh, in, in those trials. And, and 2 or 3% is not, it's not a small number when, when, when you're talking about the devastating complications such as um, choroidal hemorrhage. And this table is from a review that compares um, incidence of choroidal hemorrhage uh, within different ocular procedures, starting from cataract surgery. You can see it's about less than 1%. Corneal surgeries, keratoplasties, it's about also 0.5 up until 1%. In glaucoma, we're a bit unlucky, it can go up to 6%. And then um, with vitro retina procedures, it's about 0.1 up until 1%. Um, so I'm done with my part, now it's your turn. Now we want to talk about characteristics of patients that are prone to um, developing choroidal hemorrhage, and I want some of the residents to help me out with this slide. So who can tell me what are the systemic factors that may predispose a patient to choroidal hemorrhage? Myopia is a systemic factor. <laughs> systemic hypertension, yes. Old age. Uh, hypercoagulability disorders. Exactly, patient on antiplatelet therapy. So you, you've got it all. And some say that diabetes is also a risk factor. So now we go back to Reem. What are the ocular risk factors of choroidal hemorrhage? Myopia. Why high myopia? Because the globe is so large. So just like myopia is a risk of retinal detachment because the retina is stretched, it, it's a risk of choroidal hemorrhage because the vessels are stretched a bit more than patients with smaller or normal globes. What else? A fake here. High pre-op intraocular pressure because the the um, uh, the sudden drop or decompression will lead to choroidal hemorrhage. What else? Patients with um, um, prob diseases affecting the choroid or the choroidal vasculature. What is the common syndrome that we see in glaucoma? Patients with Sturge Weber syndrome, as well as any cause of elevated venous pressure. If you have glaucoma secondary to idiopathic elevated episcleral venous pressure, if you have patients with glaucoma secondary to an orbital process, all those patients or all those that are ocular risk factors that may predispose to um, uh, choroidal hemorrhage. What about periop factors, factors related to surgery, anesthesia? The um, uh, block itself, what else? S something related to the patient, if he has a face obese, short neck, valsalva. If you have the patient's blood pressure very high um, at the time of surgery, that's also um, a predisposing factor. As well as, we just mentioned it, sudden globe decompression. That's why during glaucoma surgery, if we're taking patient to OR for a glaucoma procedure, if the pressure is too high, 30 or 40 plus, we usually give mannitol to lower the intraocular pressure before performing the procedure. And the story doesn't end at the time of surgery. It also continues after surgery. I remember seeing a patient that had choroidal hemorrhage because he hit his eye after surgery. So if the pressure is low inside the eye and the patient receives trauma, this may predispose um, to choroidal hemorrhage, persistent hypotony after 
surgery, Valsalfa. Sometimes in glaucoma surgery, we have an accumulation of blood near a filtering blab or near a um, tube, and some people are urged for that blood to go away, so they inject um, TPA. TPA is effective in resolving that blood, but it will also drop the pressure and sometimes, sometimes predispose to um, choroidal hemorrhage as well. As if the patient has high blood pressure, along with the internist, we need to keep that in control. So let's take a break from theory and have a look at a video of, luckily it's not my video, it's a video that I found on YouTube, but I thought it, it's worth sharing with you, and it's called The Black Cloud of Death. So it's a video that demonstrates um, the occurrence of choroidal hemorrhage at the time of surgery. So this is a, a, uh, from Dr. Shannon Wong uh, from Texas. It's a phaco and a heart cataract, and the um, surgeon starts by um, sculpting and attempting to crack the nucleus. Let me just, yeah, let me proceed to this point. At this time, the surgeon noticed that there's a rent or a tear in the posterior capsule. If you can see it there. So he, he goes out and instead of risking continuing FACO, he made the decision to convert to an extra cap extraction. So the wound was enlarged in an attempt to deliver the nucleus. So now the um, nucleus has been delivered with a vectus or a lens loop. One quadrant was removed and now surgeon is removing the other quadrant. So if you have a similar complication, at this point you're relieved. The lens is out, there's no risk of a drop lens, but he didn't know that he was going to face something that's even more devastating. So let's just fast forward a bit. So he's doing vitrectomy, um, red reflex is fine, until, wait for it. You see there's a, a shadow that's starting to appear from here. Let's suppose, God forbid, you saw something like that in sight. Sergio, what will you do? Call, call, no, wrong, call your attending. <laughs> so um, immediately attempt to close, as you mentioned, the eye. And before that, you can also check the patient's blood pressure, ask the um, an anesthetist with you to lower the patient's blood pressure if it's high, give some mannitol if possible and immediately close the eye, and this is what the surgeon is going to do, but as soon as he noticed the uh, black shadow, he started, he, he'd already had one stitch, but he's now um, um, placing two other stitches. Let's just fast forward, it continues. Stitch uh, wound was closed and uh, hooks are being removed, but the blood continues to accumulate until at the at the at the end of surgery the whole red reflex is gone, and uh, yeah the whole the whole red reflex is gone so blood is probably has accumulated um, in the whole uh, posterior pole. Of course the video says that. Afterwards, just like all the videos that you see on YouTube, you never see a video on YouTube with a bad outcome. It's always a good one. So blood resolved and the patient retained good vision. Um, but this, uh, this was interesting because it clearly shows the absence of red reflex intraop and um, the quick measure of closing the eye. Okay. So now I'm going to be talking about the clinical features of choroidal hemorrhage. And um, this is important to us in glaucoma because um, sometimes choroidal hemorrhage is not that obvious clinically and there are some other, um, uh, uh, there, there are some other clinical conditions that might resemble choroidal hemorrhage and lie within the same uh, differential diagnosis. So before I'm going to start talking about choroidal hemorrhage, 
we're going to play a game. It's called the shallow AC game. So I've got six clinical scenarios, and in each one of them, we'll have a diagnosis. One of them is choroidal hemorrhage. Um, so I'm going to pick a resident for each scenario. I'm going to show you a picture. Most of them are real KKH patients, and um, we're going to discuss them um, together. And whomever answers um, in a good manner, we'll ask the chief fellow, Chief uh, Hamoud, صح? or the chief resident, sorry. Hamoud will buy a gift, maybe a cup of coffee to each one. He, he will judge whether the answer is right or not. طيب. يلا, who volunteers? Hamoud يختار عشان أبي. اختار واحد ما هم جاب عشان ما تعطي هدية. يلا عبد الله تفضل اختار رقم. Case number four. Okay, so this is a patient that's day one post trabeclectomy, and I want you to describe. Tfadal. <laughs> okay, Ooh, blib is low, high, very high blib. So what, what, what do you want to know? Pressure is four. No leak. Exactly. So this is an over-filtering blip. I'm going to go, th go through the cases for the sake of time quickly because we have six. So this is over-filtering blip. It lies within the differential of choroidal hemorrhage. The only difference is that um, here you, s you see a large blip. Sometimes filtering blip, over filtering blips can have choroidal effusion with them because the pressure is, is, is low. So you, in order to establish a diagnosis of sole over filtering blip, you need to have a look at the posterior pole. So the diagnosis is based on shallow anterior chamber, low IOP, large blip, and negative sidal test. Abdullah, mashallah, he's a very clever resident. He finished it quickly. Type, what is the management? Yes, yes. So cycloplegia, eye patch, and there's a patch that we use in glaucoma. We call it a torpedo patch. Had some torpedo patch? Give it Mean you go and wish a torpedo patch. Tadabdan. Exactly. 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 So basically, you roll one of the eye patches in a cigar-like manner. Let go cigar. Gil shayga mukhtalif. <laughs> cylinder-like manner, and then you put it on the blib itself so that it's in direct contact with the blib, and then you cover it with another patch. So this is the torpedo patch. Um, if the AC is shallow, you can take the patient to the minor and reform the AC with either viscoelastic, a thick viscoelastic helon, or gas. And some, um, if it's long-standing, some people advocate irritating the blib with something that promotes healing of fibrosis, such as blood. So you can inject autologous blood. And if it fails, eventually you can do, as Abdullah mentioned, the compression suture. Uh, you de it depends on the whole clinical picture. If the AC is flat, you cannot wait. If it's just like this patient, there's some AC depth, you can wait with um, um, mild measures, just topical psychoplegia and reducing the steroids, as you mentioned. This is how the compression suture looks like. The idea of the compression suture is that since the bleb is filtering a lot, you, you put um, mattress sutures. Some people put nylon, others use vicryl, but the advantage of nylon is whenever you are satisfied, you can remove them. Vicryl may dissolve and it's still too early. And uh, the sutures themselves are compressing the scleral flap so it doesn't allow a lot of fluid to come out. And this is how it looks under slit lamp. Shraik Ahmoud Fajab Abdullah. Kweyes? Second resident. Choose a number. La Arim. Badin Abdulaziz. Number two. Okay, this patient, this is an actual patient. Two weeks post FACO ECP presented like this.
Okay. Yes. Switch is fine. What do you want to do or no? Pressure is 18. One eight. What do you all like to see? Should I give you a it's fine. That's really good job. She will get the cup of coffee, so she has to answer. Uh, yes. Uh, you want to have a look at the fundus. This is the fundus. Optus picture, nice photographer, but ugly looking photo. <laughs> or an ugly finding. You can tell which eye it is. I, I, I can. I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> ah, yeah. Okay. There's a dome-shaped elevation in the posterior pole, and you can see that that it has a bullous appearance. Or you see those bull. Why, why do we have this appearance and a collection of fluid within the suprachoroid? This this lets you know that the fluid is in the suprachoroidal space. But why do we have this appearance? Attachments to the vortex means. Okay, what do you want to do? Do you have a diagnosis? You want to do something else? Send the patient home. Call Doctor Ibrahim Taskantuna. Yes. Okay, um, uh, if you can use the mic. Uh, since the IOP is 18. 18. And What's your impression? It's um, uh, so, uh, supracoroidal um, uh, effusion. Uh, why, oh, why is okay. it not hemorrhage? Uh, because of the, uh, the, uh, the IOP is normal. It's not... I'm not sure if it's painful or not. IOP can be low, high, and normal in effusion and hemorrhage. By the looks of it. Although in effusion, the pressure is usually low, yeah. and in hemorrhage, the pressure is usually high. But sometimes you, you see the patient early on. Mm. For example, in choroidal hemorrhage, the initial inciting event is actually low IOP. So yeah. you can have low IOP in choroidal hemorrhage. So the level of IOP doesn't tell you whether it's effusion or hemorrhage. B scan, if there's a B scan. Thank you. So you sent her for B scan, and you see yeah. a flower, mashallah. Mm. So this looks like um, uh, cirrus rather than okay. ha uh, so hemorrhagic. Okay, so we have a, describe it. Um, so it's a bullous uh, choroidal yes. uh, detachment. And here the, uh, uh, the reflectivity is? Low. Low. So as you mentioned, there's a cirrus, not mm. um, uh, <clears throat> uh, a cirrus, not a, um, a hemorrhagic, uh, hemorrhagic detachment. Yes. This appearance is a fatahiyya warda. <laughs> so this patient was observed, or uh, uh, give me your management. So the impression is that this is a serious yeah. choroidal effusion, yeah. post phaco ECP. Yeah. So okay. what, what would you like to do? I would like to observe since it's not kissing choroid, um, uh, or there is no, um, well, the AC is flat, so I would watch out for uh, lenticular touch. Mm. This uh, patient was watched for a week, and yeah. then it was flatter than that. So, uh, first of all, steroids and cycloplagia. If it progresses, mm. then um, surgical intervention is, is, um, uh, is indicated if you have good luck convincing retina. And then? Drainage. Uh, choroidal yeah. drainage. Yes. So the medications that you would give is steroids, yes. cycloplagia. Yes. Uh, in some instances, the low IOP is caused by something that's um, uh, you know taking the fluid outside the eye, whether it's a blip or a tube. So you can target that. Um, in some instances, when we have a tube that's filtering a lot, mm -hmm. we go in and ligate the tube to build up the pressure, and the choroidal will result. Mm -hmm. But it's tricky when it's after a, choroid, a, a cyclodestructive procedure, just like this patient. It's after ECP. There's nothing. It's just that the patient's ciliary processes are not secreting enough yes. aqueous. So you cannot do that. Yeah. Uh, you cannot do anything with that regard, so um, you need to go in and um, rebuild. Can I ask a question? You, yes. Sometimes we increase steroids, and sometimes we actually decrease the steroids. When do we... The, 
uh, the, the idea is that there is an ongoing process of inflammation with choroidal yes. inf uh, yeah. um, um, effusion. And I've seen colleagues from retina even sometimes giving systemic steroids for patients with choroidal effusion. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that there's an, an inflammatory component to the effusion, so you need an intense uh, amount of um, steroids to treat that. So it um, has nothing to do with the uh, glaucoma surgery, if the patient had glaucoma surgery and you want um, to induce inflammation? Yeah, in glaucoma surgery, if you want the bleb to heal, you reduce the steroids. If you don't want it to mm -hmm. heal and it's flat, you increase the steroids. But here it's a different story. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ibrahim, you wanted to add anything? So y you said it was right eye or left eye? When you saw the, no, no, uh, Reem. Yeah. When you saw the original photo, you said right, because I'm going to show the photo after resolution. Uh, and we'll I'm see if it's right or left. I think left. Left? Oh, it's ah, right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Reem. You're right. Drained, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was drained after, uh, I think, two weeks. Chamber was flat. And um, luckily, the fundus went back to normal. He didn't regain all his vision. He regained some of it only. Next resident. Abdelaziz, can you get your hand? Yes, sir. Two and four, I think. Yes. Three? OK. Um, if you can kindly pass the mic to Abdelaziz. So this, this is a patient that's post trabeclectomy a long time ago, and he presents with tearing. I've never paid attention to the patient that says, my eyes are tearing. Okay, just take some lubricants. The only scenario that you pay attention to the patient when he says that I'm tearing is when he has a filtering blip. Because a filtering blip is a timely bomb. It may leak. It, he may have endophthalmitis. So if a patient has a blip and he says, I'm tearing, don't joke with it. <laughs> so this is a slit lamp photo of an eye showing uh, moderately injected uh, conjuclear cornea, shallow AC. The patient is pseudopicic with yeah. some iris uh, loss. Um, in the other photo, I can see... Uh, so you asked him to look down, and you saw this. Yes, I can see... I, I don't know about the this height is a blip. of the lip, but there is a conj cyst, thin uh, cystic avascular uh, area within the lip. Okay. So, what do you want to do? So or just, what do you want to know? Uh, IP. Low. Like, Goldman uh, and the Fluorescein to check for uh, sidel. So obviously this is a, a leaking blip. A leaking blip. So what do you want to do? Or what are the measures that you would do to tackle a leaking blip? Um, since it is a late... Uh, a leaking blip, uh, most likely it needs surgery, especially the, the, the blip is uh, thin cystic avascular. Excellent. So how would you revise it? Um, by suturing the blip or maybe excising this uh, cystic area. Okay. Thank you. So uh, basically, as Abdelaziz mentioned, shallow AC, low IUP, low blip, and positive sidal test. If it's early post-op, a couple of days after surgery, you can try aqueous suppression. Why do you give aqueous suppressive therapy when the pressure is already low? We want R1 or R2? Junior resident. Your Faida? Oh, Jawa. To prevent? Yeah, any mechanical issue? To prevent gaping mechanically from. So basically, um, the aqueous itself is ir irritant to the, to the wound itself, so it, won't, it will not uh, heal if you have a lot of amount of aqueous. If you if give the patient aqueous suppressive therapy, the amount of aqueous inside his eye will, will reduce, so the amount of fluid going to that leaking pleb will be less. Therefore, healing will be promoted. So it's a measure to promote healing of the pleb itself. And then lubricants, whether artificial tears or serum BSS, some give a bandage contact lens to prevent um, uh, rubbing of the eyelids on the bleb itself, antibiotic prophylactically. And um, of course, those are all measures for early bleb leak. If it's late, as Abdul Aziz mentioned, surgical revision. We can do two measures in general if we want to classify bleb leak. First measure is bleb excision, removing the bleb itself and conjunctival advancement. I had a nice video of a case that we did two months ago, but unfortunately, I couldn't find it yesterday. 
I was going to bring it. The other way which was done in that patient is actually doing a compression suture. Because if you have this cyst, if you compress it, it will heal and the leak will stop. And this is what happened in this case. three cases. Can you give her the mic? We'll go a bit faster now. Uh, I'll take case number one. Okay. Yeah, um, this patient was operated in um, Qasim, I think. Okay. And um, they did cathartic surgery. He was okay. And then he presented to them a couple of months after surgery with this appearance. Mm -hmm. so I and can... he had pain and redness. He was bothered. What do you want to do? Uh, so first I will describe. I can see uh, diffusely somehow edematous cornea and diffusely flat AC as well. Yes. Um, I'd like to know the IOP. Pressure is high. 28. Uh, okay. Is, this, is, uh, is there a patent PI? Um, uh, no. Okay. Uh, I'd like to check the fundus. Fundus is flat. Um, you did the PI and the PI is patent. Pressure is still high. Chamber is still shallow. I, okay. So um, that's a diagnosis of uh, aqueous misdirection. Aqueous misdirection. I'm not going to go further for the sake of time. So whenever you have a shallow AC, high IOP, patent PI, and a flat posterior pole, um, uh, this uh, is the triad of an aqueous misdirection. And you manage it in a sequential approach. First, you, do, you give cycloplegia. And some people use the AG laser um, to disrupt the anterior vitreous phase. And if all those measures fail, you'll have to bother Dr. Ibrahim Taskintuna again, call him for another vitrectomy. So this is what happened to the patient after he underwent vitrectomy eventually, and the AC is deepened. We're not lucky like oculoplastics. We have before-after pictures of bliff or lids. These are glaucoma before-after pictures. So this is before, and this is after. Next. Baggy, one. How, how many cases we did? Four. Two more. Two more. Yeah, let's follow. Or a doctor do a la fellow and be resident. Yeah, female side. Someone volunteers. Mahmoud. Saad and Ikhtar. Female, la female. And female, we only had two, two. So I had one female and one male. Doctor Mashal. When Doctor Mashal? I see the number two. Five and six, I think. So. Okay, five. What do you want? Five. Five. Okay. So, this patient of uveitis. Yes. They called you from uveitis clinic. Patient has pain. What do you see? So, in the left photo, I can see a quiet conch, clear uh, cornea. Yes. Um, Iris Bombay with the, uh, yeah with Cyanic 360. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a white cataract. Yeah, and mature cataract. What do you want oh. to know? Um, is there a PI? No. Uh, how's the IOP? 45. Um, okay, high IOP. What's the diagnosis? High IOP, secondary two. What do you call this? Bombay and pupillary? Pupillary block. Pupillary yeah. block. If a patient has Bombay, mm -hmm. uveitis, this is a question to anyone, and the pressure is okay, would you do a PI? Some people say if there's active uveitis, it's better to defer the PI because it will promote inflammation. Um, but you eventually need to do a PI to prevent long-standing synechial angle closure because you want to move the iris away from the angle. Otherwise, synechial will develop and the patient will end up having secondary angle closure. Shukran, Dr. Mashahir. Shukran. So the diagnosis is a pupillary block. Of course, in, in the substance of a white cataract, you need to do a B scan, make sure the fundus is okay. Shallow AC, high IOP, and iris Bombay, and the management is a PI. Yalla, akhar wahta. Mail. He choroidal hemorrhage, tarabama, khalas, ma marrayna alayha. He choroidal hemorrhage, but swahadigi. 
Okay, I will, I will just go through it quickly. So this is a patient, congenital glaucoma. I think he was 18, 19, something like that. We did the filtration procedure, the second day post-op. AC is shallow. This is not his B-scan, actually, but this is a B-scan showing dome-shaped elevation, just like the choroidal effusion, but you see um, that there's a high internal reflectivity, uh, meaning that there's blood in it. And this is what we're going to discuss now. This, uh, this algorithm is all what we went through um, during our past 20 minutes of discussion. So basically, if you have a flat anterior chamber, you can go through this algorithm, whether the pressure is high or low, whether the bleb is formed or, or not, whether you have leak or not, whether the posterior pole is okay or not, and then you can finally reach your diagnosis of one of the six differentials of a shallow anterior chamber. I'll go quickly through the presentation of um, choroidal hemorrhage. So intraoperatively, even <clears throat> inside the OR, the patient may have sudden onset of excruciating pain, loss of red reflex, and you have positive vitreous pressure. So if you're doing a phaco, for example, you'll see all the contents uh, bulging towards the anterior chamber, sudden shallowing of the um, chamber, and of course, a rigid eye. And at a late stage, if you're unlucky and you didn't have the time to close, you'll have expulsion of the intraocular content. It's more subtle postoperatively. You would never miss a choroidal hemorrhage that happens at the time of surgery, but sometimes it's post-op, it goes um, undetected sometimes for a clinic visit or two. Uh, but it, you should think about it whenever you have a patient with pain, the pressure is high, there's uniform shallowing of the anterior chamber, and there's absence of the red reflex. And whenever you're, you're in doubt, always order a B-scan. This is how it looks. So um, I'll go through management. Um, I'll talk about first intra-op management and then I'll move on to um, post-op management. So immediately, um, Abdurrahman mentioned that nicely a while ago, close your wound. If you have any expul uh, expulsion um, intraocular content, try to uh, reposition the contents inside the eye, reform the AC with air or viscoelastic at the end. And, um, I've seen some people talk about doing sclerotomies at the time of the incidence of uh, choroidal hemorrhage. So if you notice it, you tamponade the eye, you close everything, you do sclerotomies. I'm not sure about the validity of that. Um, some advocate it, others don't. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, you have anything about you wouldn't um, do it, thank you. Um, and then there are some other adjunctive measures that you can do. They may sound subtle, but they would help. Um, sometimes the speculum is, is, is compressing on the eye, especially the room speculum if you squeezed it up until um, the end. Lowering the blood pressure, and as I mentioned earlier, giving hyperosmotics and sometimes even sedation when the patient is anxious because of the pain. So what about post-op? Initially, the management is conservative. The management is targeted to, towards um, dealing with pain, IOP, and inflammation until the condition resolves. And as I said, steroids sometimes are given topically, but in other instances, um, some people might also prefer systemic medications. And of course, since the IOP is high after the incident, as I mentioned initially, the IOP is actually low, but after the occurrence of choroidal hemorrhage, the IOP will soon elevate. So after it increases, you would do uh, you would give um, IOP lowering medications, and of course, serial ultrasonography to monitor um, uh, the extent of hemorrhage. So, what are the indications of drainage? Whenever you have kissing choroids, what else? Non-resolving. Okay. If you have flat anterior chamber with irregular collar touch. One last one, if there's a problem with the retina. Sometimes you have choroidal um, hemorrhage with, with retinal detachment, so if there's um, a concomitant retinal detachment, you would. Uh, this is also an indication. Um, you, this, is, this golden number is probably written in most text, uh, the texts um, that you have to wait seven to 10 days because if you do surgery earlier, you won't be able to evacuate the blood properly, so um, uh, this is the time frame for potential liquefaction. I'm going to show you a video of liquefied um, blood after a period of time. And of course, as I mentioned a while ago, if it's secondary to 
um, something filtering aqueous out the outside the eye, you can target that. So if, if there's an oval filtering brib, you can revise it. If there's an over filtering tube, you can ligate it. So this is this is a video that won uh, the Young Ophthalmologist Award two years ago in the academy. It's a nice video showing. So this is a lady that uh, underwent PKP, I think, with um, uh, PKP with uh, with cataract surgery, so triple procedure, and then she had um, a choroidal hemorrhage that did not resolve, and after seven to ten days, um, they evacuated the blood. So some say that you, you should guide it. Maybe a retina specialist is better than me giving this or explaining this video, but I'll do my best. Some say you should guide it by B-scan. So whenever there's the maximum, the location of the maximum elevation on B-scan, you go over there and just make your sclerotomies to drain. Uh, uh, and then choose the locations. Others just uh, choose an arbitrary number of six millimeters behind um, the uh, limbus. So you make the highest point of elevation. Um, Dr. Ibrahim Taskentun is mentioning that you go target the highest point of elevation on uh, B-scan. So just like uh, what we do in glaucoma, you cut through the sclera as if you're creating a scleral flap. The only difference here is that you go direct to the suprachoroidal space. And here you can see the gush of um, black um, old hemorrhage coming out. And a surgeon here is using a Q-tip to help in evacuating more hemorrhage, more blood. You can also see some some small clots coming out as well. And here, here with the cyclodialysis spatula, um, this helps in, in also evacuating the the remaining amount. And the same process is repeated if necessary if there's um, a, a, a high amount. Uh, in another area as well. You want to add anything, Dr. Brahim? Now, typically, they are left open. There's a report in the literature, Dr. Yepes, some of you have uh, uh, faced him. He used to work here. But I think that was choroidal effusion, net hemorrhage. They actually put a stent in that sclerotomy because they didn't want it to, to, um, to close. Uh, I think they used the, the, the express shunt that we use in glaucoma. They placed it in the sclerotomy because we want it to stay open even after surgery. Um, so I think we still have 15 minutes. I'm, I'm done with the presentation. There's another part that I put that I was planning to talk about if I had time, and since I have time, I'm going to go through it quickly. This is a review that a couple of members of, from our division uh, did on all the glo pediatric glaucoma procedures and the incidence of choroidal hemorrhage here at KCASH. But before I move to um, that part, um, I'd like to ask if anyone has any questions. We can answer them because questions are more important. Tfadl. Um, uh, typically, the, 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 out, the visual outcome is poor, and when you look at glaucoma trials, they always classify choroidal hemorrhage as a vision-threatening uh, um, uh, complication. I'm going to show you a slide here in this study that I think 50% had, 50 of cases had a vision of counting finger or worse, so it's poor. If you drain the choroidal hemorrhage, I'll have to refer that question to Dr. Ibrahim. I'm lucky that you're here today. <laughs> Because it's a new hemorrhage, so you know, we'll have to wait for it to record. The doctor can end this while. I've never, no, no. Even the cases that I'm going to go through here, 
in this study, none of them after evacuation bled again. Drehman. Now, as, as we just mentioned, in maximum elevation. Beast can tell you if it's infratemporal or somewhere else. Another question? Tfadal Abdullah. No, I, I don't think so, but I, I don't recall that um, that was mentioned in the video. Yes, pupillary block. Yes, if, if you have, sometimes you have traumatic synechia. Patient had blunt trauma, someone gave him a punch in his eye, and he had synechia. Those synechia will break if you give therapy, but those uveitis cases, long-standing inflammation, thick synechia will not respond to, respond to medical therapy. Any other question? I'll go just quickly five minutes. This is work that was done by Dr. Ashwag Al-Abiri, former fellow, and some of the attendings here. Um, so the aim was to identify the incidence of choroidal hemorrhage after pediatric glaucoma surgery. So they went back to track care 2014 up until 2017 and reviewed all the glaucoma surgical cases and pediatric age group, and then they found they outlined all the cases of choroidal hemorrhage. So apparently we're doing a good job. We performed 2,650 two, uh, uh, glaucoma surgeries in the pediatric age group only, and there were 17 cases of choroidal hemorrhage. Six males and 11 females, and the age ranges from one month up until 16 years. Um, majority of cases were uh, congenital glaucoma, and the other entities were gl glaucoma following cataract surgery, glaucoma associated with ocular abnormality such as Peters, and then juvenile glaucoma. Surprisingly, none uh, cases were uh, Sturge Weber. 11 were phakic, five were aphakic, and uh, one case was pseudophakic. Uh, I'm just going quickly for the sake of time. Interestingly, the IOP at the time of diagnosis, as I mentioned, was low, not high. So uh, it was eight millimeters of mercury. If you leave the hemorrhage, you see the patient after a couple of days only, then the, the IOP will build up. And the time of detection of um, the hemorrhage was, mean time was six days. Uh, and the range was from one to 60. The average was two weeks. Actually, all cases were discovered within two weeks after surgery. There was only one case that had delayed um, hemorrhage. Uh, incidence by procedure, this is probably more important to us in glaucoma. It's higher with trabeculectomy and drainage devices, lower with deep sclerectomy, which is a non-filtering procedure and uh, cyclophotocoagulation. This, is, this slide is not important to us, but it's important to our colleagues in retina. Um, I, would have th I thought that majority of cases eventually needed vitrectomy, but the truth is that only 20% only needed vitrectomy. The others resolved with either uh, conservative management or just um, uh, uh, conservative management or um, other, other um, glaucoma secondary interventions such as ligation or AC reformation. And this answers the questions of whomever asked about the visual outcome. Nine cases, 50% had count finger or worse. And then the other half, uh, five had moderate visual um, put, uh, outcome and then uh, three had good outcome. Yes, and some of them actually were children, so vision was not checked. But this is the vision at the last visit. And of course, um, um, it's retrospective and variable surgeon, so there's a certain limitation to this um, review. So uh, as, as a conclusion to this five-minute summary of uh, these cases, the overall incidence during this time period is 0.06%, 0.06%, sorry. 0.6%, uh, and the incidence is higher following, highest following these procedures compared to these. And then the surgical intervention was only needed in about a third of the cases, and in more than 50%, the final outcome was, um, uh, was poor. That's all for today. I hope you all enjoyed the lecture. 
and look forward to meet you, inshallah, in the future. Thank you. 